good evening. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Jefferson County Board of Education on Monday, November 8th, 2021. If you please join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get started tonight, I'd just like to take a moment to deal with some housekeeping things really quickly. Um, the Jefferson County Board of Education consists of individuals elected by the community we serve. Our purpose in meeting is to conduct the business of Jefferson County Schools in ensuring the quality and effectiveness of the school system. This is a board meeting conducted by the elected board members in the view of the public. We welcome public comment on the business of Jefferson County Schools in the designated forum and format. Conduct and comment outside of public comment that disrupts the ability of the board to conduct the business of Jefferson County Schools is unacceptable. Such behavior runs counter to the ideas of respect and civility that we work to instill in our students. Any member of the public who verbally or physically disrupts the business of the board will be asked to cease and desist. If the disruptive individual refuses to cease and desist, they'll be asked to leave. A refusal to leave upon request will be met with a recess of the meeting and a notice to law enforcement. As elected individuals, we're representing the people we serve and their children. Our commitment and service to them is to conduct the business of Jefferson County Schools. We will provide that service and keep that commitment under all circumstances. Letting people know the expectation, I think, clears a lot up. And just to let you know, under first offense, you're disrupting the school board meeting and preventing us from conducting the business of Jefferson County Schools. Please stop the disruption so that we can continue. The second offense, you'll be asked to leave the meeting. The third offense, if you've refused or requested to, to stop disrupting this meeting and to leave the premises, we'll be forced to call law enforcement in order to conduct the business of the Jefferson County Schools. Now, once again, if you know the expectation, I know as a parent, you tell children an expectation, they live up to that expectation. I really hope that that's what we can continue to do here. As long as I've been on this board, we've never denied the public to comment. We've never limited the number of people. We've never limited the time that we've spent on public comment. We've never bumped it to the end of a meeting. We want to hear from constituents but we just want to hear it in a civilized manner, please. And, um, you know, it's just, we're here to serve you. And you can make all the faces you want, but I mean, just to clarify a couple things, we follow West Virginia curriculum. West Virginia curriculum does not contain CRT. We do not teach CRT. The mask mandates, we're not doctors. We follow the medical advice of the public health officer. So once again, just please come and speak to us. We want to hear from you, but just do it in a kind manner and a professional manner. Just, you know, channel your inner Ted Lasso. Leave your boy Kent at home. So thank you. First up this evening, Deputy Superintendent for Instructional Support. Good evening, everyone. Good to see all of you. I have uh, given you a packet in front of you. Uh, the first part, just gonna review some committee work that uh, is 
going on currently and also some of this is upcoming. And then I'm going to just review briefly the balanced scorecard, which is what every school system in West Virginia is held accountable to. And uh, just cover that briefly as well and then certainly any questions that you might have. Uh, first up, I wanted to mention about a program of, re program of studies review committee. Uh, Michelle Cantley is currently overseeing that. And the purpose is to review school requests to add, delete, or modify existing courses, make adjustments based on state policy and procedures to ensure that they are uh, aligned with our procedures. And then also a big one that a lot of people overlook is to make sure that those codes through our WEVA system are correct because you have a, a, a long code and one, if one of those letters or numbers is off, then it's a completely different course. So that committee has already met and will continue to meet. We hope that that, that is going to meet uh, on a regular basis. And uh, I want to thank all those folks, Michelle and Jen Rowan and, and Dr. Ebersole, for uh, all their work in getting that uh, committee up and running. The next one is one that we hope to have uh, definitely meeting in the summertime and at least one other time uh, d throughout the year, Curriculum Review Committee. And that one, the purpose of that committee is to re re review curriculum requests from the schools, including supplemental and intervention-based requests to ensure that those requests are vetted through this committee. And this will help us align our resources with adopted instructional materials. As you know, every year we have an adoption. At this year, it's ELA, first semester. We hope, we hope to have our ELA adoption completed by uh, the end of the first semester. And then second semester is the science adoption. So as we adopt those primary resources, we want to make sure that our secondary supplemental and intervention uh, materials are also aligned with those. So that'll be the purpose of that committee. And certainly we want, we want to find what's uh, most appropriate for our schools and our staff and our students. Um, the challenge there is, you know, we're always seeing and hearing about the latest and greatest that improved test scores in, in said district and uh, that's not always the best fit for what we need and uh, so we want to make sure that we do that and we're very careful and deliberate about it. The last one is uh, something that uh, it's going to involve a lot of stakeholders. I'm really excited to get get into this work but as you know um, not just Jefferson County but uh, particularly border counties are really struggling with getting teachers and keeping teachers, as you've heard Dr. Uh, Gibson's retention, recruitment and retention committee, um, I'm sorry, recruitment and retention plan. Um, so that leaves um, districts with a lot of new teachers and a lot of long-term subs. So you have a, it's, it's, it's like having a classroom of students where you have students that are high flyers and students that are way behind. It's the same with our professional staff. We have long-term subs who've never stepped foot in a classroom all the way up to a brand new teacher who might have had a year of student teaching under a, an excellent teacher. So there's a wide variety of experience walking through our door even though all of them uh, or most of them are brand new. So we need to gear our professional development to that. And we want to develop a model for years one through three teachers that not only targets the new teachers but also the, the long-term subs. One of the uh, deficiencies, I believe, at the state level is that the funding that we are appropriated for mentoring is focused on new teachers, those folks who have four-year degrees who went into college to become a teacher. And uh, we struggle to find the resources to uh, really work with our long-term subs. And we have some fantastic long-term subs that we want to keep. So this plan will hopefully uh, incorporate not only our new teachers but long-term subs into the mix as well. All right. So, uh, any questions on that first part? Yeah. Yes. Um, go ahead. When you say ELA adoption, do you mm -hmm. mean like textbooks or something? It can be, but uh, it's called a materials adoption. So sometimes it's textbooks, sometimes it's uh, software, sometimes it's uh, uh, it can even be uh, reading selections. So there's a whole variety of things included in it. Um, just from my experience teaching math, there's a uh, problem with um, interpreting? Mm -hmm. Are there electronic interpretation devices available? For, for the ELA adoption? Yeah. In fact, uh, I, I've heard quite a few companies who have um, made presentations and th that is something that's readily available across all the companies that I have seen. So 
yes. Do teachers have access? And they do, but as with anything else, there's training involved, and uh, time is precious, so we will have to make sure that our teachers are well-trained in that as well. I just remember Mr. Ebersol saying a couple years ago, because I asked a couple years ago about it, and he said you had some things already. So, excuse me, I say only because I was here. Are you talking about the handheld translators that something. we purchased for is teachers? That what it is? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am, and we do have them. But those. I heard that there was something. Yes, ma'am, we purchased handheld translators that allow for instant translation between teachers and uh, students in their primary language. Um, and having subbed in a couple of classes this year, I will say that for a lot of students, they tend to use their phones just because they're handy and they're more comfortable with those. Um, but the translators are available in all of the schools. They tend to use them more in the middle schools where those students are um, at elementary, they're working with language acquisition anyway, but at middle school and high school, they tend to be focused on the content, so teachers use those. But as I said, in most of the classes I've subbed in, they're using their phones because it's text to speech and it'll translate for them. But we do have those for everyone, I yes, ma'am. I didn't know they were allowed to use phones now. I didn't realize that. No, in, in, in most, in all of our schools have a cell phone policy, but for students who need them for translations, for students who um, may need them for, um, to perform some function in their IEP, or if there's a, they forgot to bring their calculator and the, the, all the calculators in the classroom are handed out, we do have instances in which we let them use them, and that's one of them, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry. Thank you. I misunderstood that. No, it's okay. I knew what she meant. <laughs> Mr. Banks, I just had a yes. qu quick question. Sure. Um, when we're looking at the programs of, of courses between and aligning them within the schools, um, my thought is with the high schools, will they also be looking at that? I know the business classes have been one area that has been really you know, deficient in one and, and, and better in the other um, for lots of different various reasons over the years. But will we be looking to make sure that that gets back on a better path between especially the two high schools? Um, is that an area that they're looking at? Is that what you're talking about in this? Um, That's one, one of the discussion points. So uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but um, there's, there have been some discussion about that. I don't know which direction we're headed. I know that there are some courses and programs that are unique to certain schools, and I know that schools like to hang on to those, especially very successful programs, whereas other schools might have something different. So. That'll be one of the discussion points for sure. Okay. I'm thinking the reason I ask is just because of the completer program. Mm -hmm. If it's not available, you okay. know, or it is, it, it disenfranchises students at one end instead of the other. Or if there's a way that if we want to continue those programs, and we are doing really well in one school, can we video conference them into another school, even if that other said teacher cannot teach that, you know, at that right. level? they could do the, the grading and the intervention pieces there. Um, but it would then keep the same caliber of class, mm -hmm. you know, at both schools. But to come up with some creative ways that we might be able to align those better so we can make those course offerings available at both sure. schools. I will make sure I bring that up. Thank you. I have one more question. Sure. I guess, um, so I was working with Mr. Dilley on this topic, and unfortunately he left. So I'm wondering if anybody's picking it up, but it's personal finance and, um, you know, just offering it more than just the one or two weeks in civics. Mm -hmm. Is that something that um, you're considering? There's a piece of that, um, I don't have it in front of me, that's in 2510 draft. Um, I'd have to read it more specifically, but um, uh, let me take a look at that and get back to you. But uh, that has come up, not just from you, but we have heard that. It's just a matter of prioritizing. Um, our schools have a lot of things that they think are important, and certainly personal finance is something we all struggle with, I think, and need to know. should have been taught in high school. So uh, uh, we There's will There's plenty of free curriculum and um, free training definitely. for teachers. And if you're interested, I can send you lots of... Okay. Vendors. Who All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on on that? All right. The, the next section is the balanced scorecard review. You probably have seen this before. 
Um, but you'll see a picture of it on the screen. This is what it looks like from the Department of Ed website. So each district gets a report card that looks like that. Um, uh, it's our accountability measure. And each of those categories, I'm just going to go through briefly. I know you may have seen this before, but the, the most important thing here is I want to make sure that, you know, people assume since we're going through a pandemic and all the other things associated with it, that the accountability goes away and it does not. Uh, we are still held accountable to these standards. And um, our next uh, principals meeting, we're going to give a quarterly update on, on these. Uh, some of these are hard to find quarterly benchmarks. Uh, others are very easy. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes just going through those with you. Um, on your paper that you have in front of you, you'll see that uh, each one of them has a letter and that corresponds to the page that's behind it. So, so the first thing is academic performance and what you'll notice the first things that I'm going over are all grades three through eight. Academic performance is just that. It's how students achieve on that test. There's a formula for it that they use to determine whether the district meets uh, the criteria necessary. And I have included that with you, with your information. Um, for uh, grades three through eight, it's called the West Virginia General Summative Assessment. We just call it the GSA. And for high school, it is the SAT. So that's one measure of academics at the elementary level. The second one is progress, and that just refers to the growth that a student might would make from one year to the next. So um, over the course of the academic year. So there's a, you can see that from the formula associated with that. Uh, letter C is a, an accountability measure for both elementary and, the, and middle, as well as the high school. And that's uh, progress with EL. You can see the, the formula that is used there um, for, for uh, proficiency in English language. <coughs> Um, moving on to attendance, uh, this is one I, I found very interesting this year and, and last year because the thing that we have this year and last year that we have never had before is quarantining. And quarantining has really made uh, attendance codes very interesting. Are they considered absent per this accountability measure or are they considered present? And it, it comes down to whether they completed their work or didn't complete their work and it's, it, it gets very confusing. So the attendance piece, uh, uh, Devin has really done a great job in getting in and un understanding that and educating our principals on that. But that has certainly been a challenge uh, during the pandemic is uh, making sure that uh, we are following the appropriate guidelines for attendance. Um, for attendance, we are not judged based on the school's attendance data. Um, we used to get a number. Um, that was our average daily attendance. We are judged now based on uh, chronic absenteeism. And so the standard is that 90% of the students must be there 90% of the time. So that means uh, anybody who's really good in math in here, um, if, if they have to be there 90% of the time and there's 180 days in the year, that means that when they get to day 19 or 18, then they're chronically absent for the year. So that gives you a feel for what that looks like. Uh, a student who's chronically absent would be at day 18, they would be considered chronically absent for the year. And there's no going back, you know, you're, once you're chronically absent, you are. So that's the standard that's in place. It is different than it used to be. Again, uh, it used to be the average daily attendance. Uh, letter E, behavior. Uh, I will say this, and Dr. Ebersole is here tonight too. Um, we are as well as many other districts are very, very much struggling with student behaviors. Remember, our students have not been in school for a period of time. Um, it started from the beginning of the year and continues. Um, and we, when you mix that with uh, new staff, um, we're struggling. And um, I'm not ashamed to, to admit that. Uh, we really uh, are doing the best that we can. And I, 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 have, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Jefferson County Schools, for having a SOMO department, because if there's ever a need for a SOMO department, it's right now, and it's not just with our kids, it's with our adults, too. And so uh, I, I definitely say that uh, we are struggling with student behaviors, um, 
but at the same time, uh, our adults are learning how to manage very difficult behaviors, too. Um, graduation rate, you probably are aware of this. There's a four-year and a five-year graduation rate that the high schools are held accountable to. And uh, there's a formula for that as well. I won't get into that, but uh, that's uh, a standard for high school only. And then finding the last two um, on track to graduate, uh, to meet that, uh, students must uh, earn at least 12 credits overall by their sophomore year, and then also have at least two of those credits be in four of the primary areas, which means uh, English language arts, math, science, and social studies. So that's how that is measured if they're on track to graduate. And then finally, post-secondary achievement, there's a few ways that uh, districts are measured in that particular standard. One of them is AP, number of students that uh, take AP and score a three or above in AP classes. Then also um, dual credit, college bearing classes is another way to meet that standard. And then finally, the CTE component, uh, meeting the uh, uh, four required courses in state approved CTE program of study. So that is the West Virginia balance scorecard. Those are the categories that we're held accountable for. Um, we, our goal is to provide principals with as up-to-date information as they can to see where they're at and make adjustments as needed. So uh, we are attempting to do that at our next principals meeting and share the data that is available. All right, any questions on that? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, when will we see the new attendance policy proposal? I, 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 there I was don't a know. attendance policy that came up and right. it kept needing work and it's never been back. So I was yeah. wondering. Sure. So that's one of the things that we have later on in the agenda tonight is to talk about the, uh, you'll see the NEOLA policy adoption process that we're discussing. Um, really to work towards having a common understanding of what is part of the required state policy that is not subject to change by the local board and what authority the board has above and beyond that uh, policy so that we have a, a, a common, clean, uh, transparent process for everyone. And once we work through that process and have some uh, mutual understanding from the board, we'll bring that attendance policy back. Thank you. And um, so how are you rated on behavior? Is it the number of referrals? Because that's the impression. It's that the I percentage have. of students who receive suspensions okay. has and to be at uh, less than, or not more than, let me see, 90% 90, 90 of students didn't receive a discipline referral, meaning out of school suspension. Mm -hmm. It just seems like... Um, um, so, I mean, I see that the schools are really trying to boost attendance and um, limit the referrals, which impacts the classroom. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just, is it to compensate for low achievement? You know, if you can boost the graduation rates and boost the attendance score, lower the discipline, you turn out okay, even if there's minimal achievement or like when do we hear about achievement also? Well, so achievement is, it, is uh, obviously is a part of the balanced scorecard. Yeah, um, I know. Right. I, I can see it, and, but I mean the board and the public, like what is the school system doing to improve achievement? I mean, it looks like there may have been some increase in reading. Um, just from my memory, I'm not comparing right now, but I'm looking at the most recent for mm. 11th grade. And I don't recall ever being past 50%. So at least the reading for 11th grade, I see that as 60%, which is good, but everything else is, you know, most of these are below 50%. And what is the goal? You know, what is reasonable um, for, you know, this school system? What, what is your goal? Well, our goal, I mean, my goal, and Dr. Gibson probably would share this, is continuous improvement. And so where were we and where do we need to go? We have brand new teachers. We have a lot of long-term subs. So obviously, one of our goals has to be professional development 
and, and training those teachers on best practices. But I mean for student yeah. achievement, like what, what right. is the goal? Do you want everybody at 70%? Do you want 70% at 70% or? We have not set goals, uh, number goals. I will say that as we meet with principals and they set goals for themselves as well as the schools, um, they do have individual goals for their school. So what is reasonable? I mean, we, I, I, we know that we, Jefferson County may be doing better than most of the very poor school systems in Jefferson County that lack the resources that Jefferson County has and the educated population, so it's not really fair to compare with the state. So, you know, um, and it's not really fair to compare with Loudoun. So I just, I just feel like, I mean, I, we've never had that discussion. Mm -hmm. It's not that I can recall um, hearing much about achievement. I mean, last year at this time, I requested to see, um, and I think Mr. Osborne brought it up, but I never did see the first quarter versus second quarter, you know, how the students were doing at mm -hmm. least. The grades are, not that the grades are a reflection of, um, learning, but um, I just feel like achievement should be a priority. I mean, I know that hiring teachers and training teachers is, but I just personally think that we should emphasize that more. It, it certainly is the highest priority. I think, you know, in my mind, school safety is the highest and then achievement is right behind it. But. Um, I'd be glad to bring any data to you to show um, how we're doing uh, throughout the year, whether it be grades, benchmark data, attendance data, anything related to this. Uh, again, we do plan on sharing that at our next principals meeting on the 16th. And then I can follow up in December and bring that data to the board meeting. I think another thing that will help is um, last year you didn't have the ability to, we didn't have LSIC meetings. And typically we have the LSIC meetings and they delve into all of the data for each school pretty deeply mm -hmm. as far as achievement, behavior, I mean all of the statistics. And Mr. Ebersol does a great job putting those packets together. So I think, you know, we'll be seeing that when we have our LSIC meetings this year. I, I mean, I went through it all. I mean, it's all online. I went, you know, I, I have a general idea. I went and compared different years and different schools and but I'm saying you know to have the board presented the information and to hear what the plan is to um, you know really focus on achievement because I just don't hear that <laughs> and I don't hear you know we need money for this to you know help with achievement like Alex I mean I just think Alex is a wonderful math program to supplement in math classes, to um, you know, fill in the, the gaps in learning, and I would love to you know pay money for things like that that you know have that are helping students, and and then there's Tutor Me where all kids get free tutoring. Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it. I don't yeah, know much about it's it. It's like every student in the school system, um, free tutoring, SAT, uh, writing papers, they can get help with editing, and then just any kind of um, homework help. I mean, I don't know how much that costs, but mm -hmm. those are two programs that are student-focused, and personally, that's mm -hmm. what I care about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank hey. you very much, Mr. Mm -hmm. Banks. You're welcome. Mr. Banks, just real quick, that, sure. that last piece there, the completion of the four required courses in the state approved CTE program, mm -hmm. that was what I was talking about as far as making sure that as we're looking at the beginning page, right. that we have that available and it's very clear that kids can sign up for it <coughs> so that both schools can be scored um, the same way because right. okay. they both have the same opportunities there. Um, and the only other question I had was about the um, the attendance. So as far as 
right now with the attendance policy and the 90 percent is it 90 percent of un so it's unexcused absences or if it's quarantined or an excused absence it's still not counted in that or you still count in your 18 days it's 18 days period no matter what the reasoning is yes however <laughs> It, the quarantining has introduced a whole new aspect to it that is that an excused or unexcused and so we're trying to if, if a student is quarantined and at home and you know essentially uh, doing what they would be doing in school uh, and attending li uh, live sessions at, at home then they should be counted present so okay so that, that's you can see the dilemma set, there take mm -hmm. the numbers apart there and see yeah it was it was designed to be a a black and white you're here or you're not here but the pandemic has made it more gray and so we're trying to navigate through that and again Devin has done a wonderful job with that so okay. thank, thank you thank you all right is there a motion to adjourn the minutes from the regular board meeting held October 25th 2021 okay. thank you mr. cable is there a second Second. Thank you, Ms. Ogden. Any discussion? All in favor of approving the minutes from the board meeting held October 25th, 2021, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right, citizens' comments. Um, just a reminder that you're limited to three minutes, and please don't make negative or derogatory comments using a name or position by which an individual can be identified. Comments may not be threatening, profane, vulgar, or abusive, or the speaker will be required to cease his or her comments. First up, we have Karen Buck, yep. followed by Joanne Curran. Here are some facts. This board never answered my questions, my two questions from the last meeting. Here's another fact. On or about October the 7th, this board delivered a check for $20,000 to the health department, Dr. Reed. Uh, this, would, this would be taxpayer dollars. October the 29th, the FDA authorized the experimental Pfizer vaccine for kids 5 to 11. That's authorized, not approved. There's a difference. On November the 2nd, our health department, Dr. Reedy, announced a COVID vaccine clinic for children five years old to 11 years old at a church. On Friday, November the 12th, and Saturday, November the 13th. By the way, here's the $20,000 right on the budget. On November the 5th, this board broadcasted a public service announcement about the vaccine clinic. Just being good citizens, just passing this information along, they got nothing to do with it, about the vaccine clinic. But the board put a disclaimer on the health department vaccine clinic flyer. Actually, there's two. The first uh, disclaimer is, says that the COVID vaccines are not required for school attendance. Parents remember that. And the other disclaimer is a non-endorsement of an endorsement of a vaccine clinic that you guys helped to plan. And you did help plan it, after all. Your disclaimer is on the health department flyer. The appointments are made by school, according to the kid's last name, at a certain time of day. And on Friday, November the 12th, which is a virtual school day, no kids are in school, kids are all home, so kind of like a three-day weekend so in case of those pesky little adverse reactions. Now, we have a public service announcement for you. Just for the record, with regard to the COVID vaccinating and testing of our children, you are hereby advised that a child's presence in school does not count as implied or informed consent on the part of the parents or the child. With regard to the COVID vaccinating testing of our children, you are hereby advised a child's presence in school does not count as implied or informed consent on the part of the parent or the child. This disclaimer that you have put on the health department uh, flyer here appears on this flyer on your website and your app. This puts you right in the middle of it and inserts you into the experimental injection scheme. 
no matter what the legal language you have on here, this is a very precarious position for you people to be in regarding experimental injections in humans. And I think you know what I mean. Thank you. Next up is Joanne Curran, followed by Valerie Arnold. Welcome to Remedial Gender Studies 101. I'm your instructor today. I've worked with elementary through high schoolers, mostly girls, for 30 years. Could you ever imagine a day that we'd seriously talk about choosing your own gender? If you haven't defended these issues before, why not? Because it's really not a truth. It's a fad. Teenagers follow fads, but you've been had by a fad again. There have always been fads in fashion, hair, cars, houses. They make money luring you into their fads. We follow for acceptance and status. And is there any group more prone to following and needing acceptance than teenagers? Their whole life is about being liked. But there's a dilemma too. They also want to be independent, rebellious, and different. But in our effort to be so inclusive, we've made everything acceptable. They have nowhere to go to rebel. And since each fad has to be more extreme than the previous one, you adult lemmings have backed them into this absurd corner of gender identity. If it's not money, what is the motive of taking this LGBTLMNOP alphabet soup to such extreme until mom and dad finally get mad? Here's a radical question. How many middle schoolers are gender confused? I believe all of them, and none of them. I'll explain. Let's say you're a 12-year-old girl. You've played with all the kids in your neighborhood since you were little. Now as you approach puberty, the boys seem different in an uncomfortable, curious new way. So as a girl, you have two options. You still want things to be the same fun with the boys you've played with all these years, so you act and dress more like them to fit back in. I think you'll find the evidence backs me up. The girls go through a stage where they want to wear their brother's clothes and shop in the boys' section. Mine did. This is normal puberty. Or at least it was until perverse supposed adults with an agenda say, oh no, this is a sign that deep down you want to be a boy. Now we must stop this evil puberty from taking your life in the wrong direction. We must not let you go down this adolescent trail to grow into your birth gender. The other option an adolescent girl has is to be scared of these new reactions to boys and to cling to the safety of her familiar BFF girlfriends. And now we know what the fad following crucifiers in positions of power in school will say to this. Oh, see, you really like girls better than boys. Here, let us show you how to achieve the deepest relationship with girls. If you fad following indoctrinators would just leave them alone instead of trying to be the gender gods and let their parents parent, they would come out of the other side of this difficult time of puberty with a healthier view of themselves. Yes, adolescence is tough. It's supposed to be. But we must all go through it in the same way a baby chick must fight its way out of its shell. If you try to help too much, you interfere with nature and they are too weak to survive. You are killing them. Just leave them alone. Thank you. Next is Valerie Arnold. So I apologize, I'm not very prepared tonight. Um, these ladies are way more prepared than I am. Follow the medical advice today. Why don't you follow the advice of Dr. Robert Malone? He's the um, doctor who pioneered the mRNA vaccine. He recommends it's not safe to take. Um, just research his name, you can find it. It's probably not on Google. You have to go to an alternative website to find his name. Um, you're right, you are here to serve us. We pay your bills. We pay your salary, rather. Um, you're here to serve us. You serve at our pleasure. So COVID has a 0.0007% of killing your kid. This is reported by the CDC website. And, and those deaths were in previous cancer patients. Uh, a phone call at my work the other day, a uh, lady, hi, my name is uh, so-and-so, just got the second dose of the J&J, &J. I'm pregnant, and now I have a blood clot. I need to see a hematologist. 
It's just one of many that, I've, that I see on a daily basis. Follow the facts once again. Bacterial infections in the Spanish flu epidemic were the cause. Um, were the primary cause of death, not the viral source. If you can see my face, this is the eczema from I get what I get daily from wearing a mask eight hours a day. I'm sure the kids are much worse. They don't have the access to the uh, alcohol wipes like I do, constantly cleaning my face. Also, kids uh, retain CO2 with these masks. Their airway is much smaller than that of an adult. And I hope, finally, that Loudoun County has made an example of you guys. I hope they have. Uh, their parents are standing up and taking the power back, and, and the... Uh, cards are crumbling. They've already crumbled. So hopefully that, you know, they make an example from for the parents here. And one more thing, if anybody needs a religious exemption, I have one from a renowned pastor in North Carolina. Saved numerous jobs across the country. If you need it, please get with me and I will forward the letter to you. Uh, nobody should have to take something that they are not comfortable with taking. If, if you need the exemption, just please get with me and I'll be glad to forward it to you. Thank you. All right. Next up is the consent agenda. Uh, yes, ma'am, you'll see that there are a couple of red line items, uh, number 15, 16, and 17. We simply added the long-term substitute terms on there so that folks would understand clearly that uh, those are the positions that are the substitutes with benefits where we were hiring a full-time sub uh, to cover in those areas. These subs, unlike the teachers and the aides, would not be confined to specific uh, schools. They would be spread across that department on all 17 schools. Uh, number 46 is um, a red item because that resignation was received after the board agenda was published. And until the board accepts a resignation, we can't post that position. And of course, we would like to post teaching positions as promptly as possible. Um, and the very last one, number 47, uh, for those of you who've been in the county for a while, you recognize that we've had a middle school wrestling program for many years. However, we've only had a single one at Harpers Ferry Middle School because we were unable to procure a wrestling coach anywhere else. All four middle schools, those students had to go to Harpers Ferry in order to wrestle. And uh, by grace, we were able to find a teacher who actually had a wrestling background who is willing to... Uh, uh, teach wrestling at Wildwood Middle School and to be able to take students on that into the county so they don't all have to travel to Harper's Ferry. So, um, uh, I will, and finally, I will point out that you'll note and to thank Human Resources, we have six new subs uh, on this new agenda that we're bringing on board. They have been going to job fairs. We have been recruiting um, we've made uh, phone calls from the superintendent. Uh, we have actually offered, one, one gentleman, we actually offered to host him and his uh, fiance for dinner because he said he needed her permission to consider it. So <laughs> we offered to take them out to uh, dinner after their drive from Morgantown. We really are doing everything that we can to show them that this is a great place to live and work and raise their children and that we want them here. So um, we appreciate everyone else who does the same. And, and uh, help sell Jefferson to other folks. <coughs> Thank you. Is there a motion, excuse me, a motion to approve the consent agenda with the um, changes to 15, 16, 17, 46, and 47? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Ogden. <coughs> Any discussion? I have a question on the superintendent's approval. Number six and seven, the same person has two full-time jobs or are they part-time jobs? Oh. They're substitute. What's the same person with two jobs? 
Oh, okay. Well, um, and uh, according to Miss Loring, which who I'm enormously grateful for, she's actually the number six. She's an autism aide and a long-term sub, uh, but she also wanted to be approved as a substitute aide so that uh, should that opportunity arise in the future, she'd be able to utilize it. That's simply a, a, a placement so that she can if she chooses to. Oh, so, so these aren't all not being hired for positions they're just well it, as you'll note on the autism aid it's a long-term sub so oftentimes that long-term sub is someone who's in that position because we can't find someone full-time if we're able to find someone full-time for that job then they come back in and she can work as a substitute aid right I, I'm just wondering how often these are listed as just placeholders when it looks like it reads as if this person's being hired as a substitute aide. And, and perhaps Ms. Loring can clarify that better than I can. Um, so Ms. Rhodes has not been hired by us yet. And so um, the action number seven actually puts her on the substitute aid list to be able to start to track her seniority. Um, she was fortunate due to the um, long-term sub positions and long-term sub needs for various vacancies um, or absences that she was able to get the autism aid position. So that's why she's on here twice is that we, um, since she's brand new, we had to appoint her or ask for her to be approved as a substitute aid for the school district to start her seniority. But she was fortunate to actually get an placement for the time being um, at Driswood. <coughs> I guess it's not up to me. It's yeah, just, I, I know it's confusing. It. It's just we're following code, so it's it, it that doesn't always translate into the most <laughs> practical sense of things. But we're just trying to make sure we get her on the sub list. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And what is the um, what's the need for the the cafeteria manager? Have we not had one there before at Blue Ridge? Yeah, we had previously reduced that position um, in an attempt to combine those two cafeterias and simply have one manager managing both of them. And it has proven uh, very problematic uh, in managing both of those uh, with fidelity, in particular uh, with the cook shortages. I was actually up there, what, two weeks ago, week and a half ago, subbing. Uh, I apologize to all those children that the veggie fried rice was less than adequate that day, but I did what I could. Um, so w again, uh, having a cafeteria manager, we found that we could not run both separate buildings with both separate uh, lunches. In addition, we've, in order to space the children out, we've, we've pulled our lunches out further. We've had more small lunch periods than, than uh, big lunch periods. So that increases the time of the day that they have to be in their building and not be able to shift back and forth. So it's been necessary. That's a position that we had. We cut it and we need to restore it. Thank you. Any other questions? All in favor of approving the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right. No unfinished business. And next, policy review and revision. Testing out. Okay. So um, the next two things that you're going to hear are not for vote. They're for putting these out for, well, they're for putting them out for a public comment. They're not for adoption of the policy. So the first one is the procedure for testing out of a class. And uh, I think that this will is a good illustration of why we are going to talk a little bit more about the policy adoption um, process. I think there was very positive intent on the part of the staff and the board who originally created this testing out policy um, and that they wanted to encourage students who uh, tested out of a program during the summer uh, to um, be able to utilize a pass fail option and for a failure on that singular test not to harm them. When we had our uh, special circumstance review by the West Virginia Department of Education, they said, well, we understand very much why your board would want to do that. 
they cannot. <laughs> that runs counter to West Virginia Department of Education policy and you have to revise that. They agreed to let the previous credits earned in that manner to stand. Uh, they will not moving forward. So since our program of studies is coming out in December, we have to revise this uh, before we publish our new program of studies to not mislead students or parents because it is a change from what they've become used to. So you'll note that um, under the grading credit portion when it talks about testing out um, at this point, testing out will not result in a pass fail. The student who takes the examination will get a test score and that test score will count as a grade. Um, if it is a failing score, it will count as a grade and it will remain on their student record. Um, there is no retest provision for this test, unlike exams that we have during the school year where if a child falls below a certain percent, we um, uh, give them an opportunity to tutor and then to go back and take a retest. That does not pertain to this. Uh, it is very, very important that we get this information out to parents so that there is no misunderstanding that if they test out, it will be, their grade will be what they get on that final examination and it will stay on their permanent record. And this is the state's rule, not your proposal, right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for asking. Am I reading that correctly? They have to have an 80% to pass, but if they fail it, they can fail it? They have to have an 80% in order to go to the lab portion. Okay. That's, yeah, and, and if that needs clarification, we can, we can certainly clarify that, but that is, um, that has to do with a pretest to be able to take the labs. So but their final get, examination is their final grade. So if they get, say, a 75, Obviously, that's a passing grade. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Does that mean they get half the credit, but they can't take the lab portion? I think that's no, why. No, there's no half credit. They either get the credit or they don't. But I can I can go back and clarify as well that with WBDE. Would, yeah, just just make it clear that it's. It doesn't really matter if they can go forward to the lab portion or not. They need to understand that if they don't do, if they do not get an 80, so it's different than taking the class, right? Yes. To take the class, you can get a 66, and you can pass the class and get your credit. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to test out, the standards are obviously higher. Mm -hmm. You have to get an 80, or you get nothing. Well, so, kind of like that's how I'm reading that as a parent. Like if mm -hmm. I was reading that for my child, so definitely we need clarification that, and then somebody's going to ask. And that needs to be clarified. Why is that? Why are the standards different that it's a higher percentage to pass mm -hmm. it if it's not during the year? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Which, yes, again, just if we can clarify mm -hmm. it. And I think that that was their initial, we don't want you to move on to the lab portion if you don't have a sufficient understanding of this, but we may need to re-examine that given that their final written examination is going to be their final grade. So um, certainly I can uh, take that back as well and ask them to relook at that section and that section be under application, correct? Yeah, and just okay. so that we can understand it as well, because if you're taking the class during the year and you get less than 80%, you're still allowed to move on. Mm -hmm. Your goal is to pass the class. So if we're going to make the standards higher for this, there needs to be a good opportunity to explain why that is for parents and, and kids, right? They want to know. I mean, some parents are going to be quite happy with, hey, I got a 69 in that class. I passed it. I just didn't want my grade. I don't want to have to take it. Obviously, mm -hmm. the kids usually who are testing out are not those kids. They want the A, they're mm -hmm. trying to work hard to get an A. So, but we just need to make it clear. And the last piece of that under other, where it says the students will be supplied a copy of the content standards and objectives from the textbook and the textbook for the class. I know the biggest, absolutely biggest complaint across the board we get. There's no date for that. So I have to decide by April that I'm gonna take this test next year. But I'm not given those materials until the end of the school year or the summer and I have to take that test in two weeks. And that's the amount of time you gave me to study. So if that's the case, if I sign up to take this by April, I want those materials by April. So I have from April until I take that class in the summer, I should be given that amount of time to study and make sure that I understand that material. 
<coughs> so I think that needs to be in that policy as well um, when they're able to get those that material. Yes, ma'am. I have another question. Um, yes, ma'am. It, you said that they can't retake the test, but can if they um, fail, can they take the class and get a passing grade, which would replace that grade? That is a good question. Yes, ma'am, they can take the class. I do not know, and that is a good question, ask whether or not it replaces that previous grade or they average them, but I will find that out for you. Yes, ma'am. I do know that they can then turn around and take the class in person. Uh, did this wisdom come from the state board? Um, this is in WVDE's policy, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. And this does not stop kids from taking those classes in the summertime, <clears throat> like the health and the gym and the other classes. This does not change that. Am I correct? They still no. have the opportunity to take those classes in the summer. They do if they're offered during the summer, and we have so far. There's no reason to believe, of course, with yeah. staffing shortages, I'm always reluctant these days to say, oh, we will absolutely have this class, but yes, ma'am, we have so far during the summer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you going to vote to place this out on public comment, and then we will... Is that what you're asking us to do? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is there a motion to place the testing out policy for public comment for, is it two weeks that you're asking for? Yes, ma'am, until your next board meeting. All right. Is there a motion? Um, so moved with the clarifications, if we can get them, yes. Thank you, Ms. Osgood. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Osborne. All right, all in favor of placing I, I the had a oh, statement. Yeah, I just want to make sure that so you're going to make these corrections and find out about whether they can retake and you'll put that in there before it goes out? Um, the ones that I do find out, yes, ma'am, I will. I'll put that clarification on there. If there's anything that I don't find out uh, until late in the posting, I'll bring it back. I'll bring it to you because you can make any changes up until you vote for it. Or we could put it out for an extended Or you could put it out for extended. The, the reason that I would like to get out for public comment is because the latest date that we should adopt this is that first meeting in December because we're releasing the program of studies. As you know, we've been very, very stringent to say when kids get their report cards at the end of this year, High school students will get their schedules with the report cards. I don't know about you guys, but my son's planning schedule, his pet plan for next school year's classes came home on Friday. It came home on Friday with his classes for next year lined out for my signature as a parent with his pet plan. So when I tell you that we have been righteous about giving the counseling staff the time and the space um, and taking administrative things off of them that were pulling them away from student counseling. We've taken those off and they are using that time. They will meet with every single rising eighth grader and every single high schooler this year, guaranteed. So um, part of that is uh, us getting a, a correct program of studies. When um, um, Mr. Banks was talking about the Weavis codes, one of the things that we're doing this year, and I, I'm not sure how Dr. Rowan's still standing or Dr. Eversaw um, or Kelly Wolf, is we're placing um, barcodes for each one of every single Weavis class and getting scanners for the counselors. So you pick your classes, this class, this class, this class, this class, so that we don't have transcribing errors from people from one thing to the next. So that program of studies has to be across the board, no question, accurate. And this is one of the things that has to go in there because we don't want parents looking at next year's program of studies and us having to go back after it's published and say, oh, there was a change. Can't test out. Thank you. So there's a motion on the floor to put the testing out policy out for public comment. Um, for two weeks with those clarifications. All in favor say aye. 
Aye. Opposed? Thank you. All right, next up, superintendent evaluation. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, this past year, um, the legislators passed a new policy, policy, well, uh, they passed new legislation, the uh, West Virginia Department of Education passed uh, policy 5309 that um, outlines uh, changes in the superintendent's evaluation process. Um, as you saw posted online, we had both the state uh, policy, we had a um, the proposed, so the West Virginia Department of Education took that policy and they created a template for school boards to use. And prior to December 31st of 2021, boards must adopt a superintendent's evaluation process that is compliant with this. So essentially they said, here's a template that we guarantee is compliant you're welcome to create your own, but it also has to be compliant and it has to be done by December 31st of 2021. I also posted up and you saw online, um, the West Virginia School Board Association did a 30 question FAQ for boards that might have questions about this process. I, I just have one question. Have yes. you evaluated the difference between what was already being done and the mm -hmm. new and highlighted any changes needed or well in the previous one um, that you saw they had a lot more um, I think they had a lot more latitude for school boards to choose things that weren't as focused on um, academic performance and on this one they have been much more um, they kept all the same timelines the September 15th, the June 30th, the March 1st, they changed none of those timelines. What they did a lot of was number one, they sort of streamlined all of the criteria where they said, here's what you should be focusing on as a board, right? And then they listed those out. Um, they basically said that uh, student performance, academic performance is a, is a must have. And here are all the other areas that we would recommend that you as a board do. They also um, outlined um, like process they felt like you should follow, which this board has been. We do a uh, public um, uh, process every year where you get the data from the previous year, you get feedback from the leadership team, you set goals for the superintendent and you do that by September the 15th. Um, and then you evaluate. Um, so when you look at the evaluation instrument it's almost exactly what this board had used previously where it lays out what your goals are your timeline how you're going to measure it and then each one of the ratings and any comments so it's not i would say it's not that different from what this board has been doing but i think in other places perhaps they may have been a lot less formal about the superintendent's evaluation and they were trying to get some consistency across the state and the school board association was also talking about doing a training session for boards on the new evaluation yes ma'am they did say that they would have a training on that um, in this school year but they haven't said well we haven't received i don't think you have you seen anything janet we haven't received anything from them yet on what the date's going to be. But we need to adopt within a month. So. I know. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you are entirely correct about the uh, inanity of that uh, timeline. Yes, but I should have gone in a different order. But I believe it was just being presented to the state board in November, if I remember they correctly. They did. Their timeline. So it's all tight. It's it is. It is. But uh, understandably, in an ideal world, they would have trained boards on the criteria and then let boards build instruments. And certainly at this point, you still can. And there's nothing to prevent you from adopting one instrument in policy and then in the future developing your own instrument as long as it continues to have all of the required elements. Okay, so are you asking for us to- Put it out for public comment. Put it out yes, for public comment. Make a motion for public comment. Thank you, Ms. Ellington. 
Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. All in favor of putting out the superintendent evaluation process for public comments, say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Thank you. All right, Neil, a policy adoption process. Okay, so we <laughs> talked about a couple of policies this evening, and um, uh, as the board will remember right when we entered into COVID land, we had just began the process of uh, utilizing NEOLA as our, um, really like our, our policy uh, vessel, okay? The board sets policy, and in order for it to be uh, transparent and accessible to the public, what venue you put that in matters a great deal. So um, why we had chosen NEOLA in that process before is because it is a very transparent process. It is completely online. It is searchable um, by term. So you can go in and type in, uh, you know, uh, transportation and it will bring up every policy that we have on transportation. It then also has mapped to it administrative guidelines, which are like standard operating procedures. So you have a policy and you click on that policy and it says, here's the operating procedures. Here's how we um, follow that policy here. And look, here's the form that lets you do that. Click on the form and you can fill it out. Um, in addition, one of the things that we really appreciated about NEOLA is that um, when they place the policies uh, out to the boards and the localities for adoption, they've been vetted by West Virginia education attorneys. They guarantee that the policy portions that they give you that are from them from the state are legally compliant and that they will uh, defend the county in any sort of legal proceedings that involve um, um, protest or uh, uh, counter to those policies. So all of those things, and they do that twice a year, which we felt like it was really great. So we started that adoption process. We adopted, if you'll remember, section 1000, section 3000, section 4000. Um, those have all been approved by the board. Those were painful processes. Um, and um, they were painful to an extent because we tried to do policy adoption in the same way that we had previously. We still have a 319 page PDF that is cumbersome and it is not at all transparent. <laughs> so uh, we were frustrated because it was consuming a lot of time. It was not um, resulting in a lot of clarity for the board and for the public that there are things that they just are. They are policies from the state and they are thou shalt and we can discuss them all day long but they're not going to change. And then there are things that you as a local school board can add to those or can change and you take the responsibility for those changes on yourself at the local level. Um, so we went back to uh, Sam Callball. Uh, who is the representative for NEOLA for the state of West Virginia. And we had asked him for some advisement moving forward. And we sat down as a team. All of you have in front of you a, a two-page document that lists each section in the NEOLA policy and outlines an adoption process uh, that involves um, both uh, the content matter experts in those chapter areas reviewing uh, Neola's um, policy, going through there and of the places where a local board has discretion, making recommendations in areas of discretion, um, and then on that timeline, bringing that to the board and conveying in the policy, these were the areas of discretion, and here's what our recommendation is and why, without a review red line of policy that is not um, up for evaluation or change 
to keep things from getting confusing. So um, this is a process that has been used in a number of other school systems throughout the state and in a number of other states where NEOLA operates. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Callball up here to speak about it. Good evening, thank you. It's a pleasure to be in Jefferson County. My first visit to Jefferson County was back when my oldest sister began teaching somewhere in the early 60s at uh, Harpers Ferry High School. So I remember my visit to Harpers Ferry uh, uh, very fondly and uh, always enjoyed coming to uh, Jefferson County. I think we had a very productive meeting this afternoon and uh, cleared up a, a lot of issues and uh, talking about going with your existing policy and redlining it and uh, we really don't operate that uh, that way uh, we work in uh, six states and we do the same process in all six states but we really use the templates that we're providing to you as a starting point now in those templates uh, um, if it's not a Straight, strictly a state code, we try to offer you a lot of choices. So for example, if you're talking about a social media policy, we have tons of choices there how you want to do that. So that's what these committees will be doing, is uh, they'll be going through these uh, templates and making these choices and then eventually getting them to you. But the process is that the, uh, we have these committees working on it, your staff members, and uh, once they go through and using board docs make their choices then they let me know and i'll come over and meet with those committees and very quickly we will go through what the work they've done I answer any kind of questions or if there's any misunderstanding we'll clear that up that, at that time and then if they're satisfied with that they actually uh, it goes from the first draft marked and then they let our production office know, say these policies are ready to be processed. Then our production office gets busy, processes those and puts them in the first draft clean. So now the committee has taken a re-look at that. If they change their mind and want to do anything differently, then those particular policies they might want to change, they can put it in a second draft marked and so on. So it's kind of a process. Now it's important that we end up with a policy manual that serves Jefferson County's needs. So uh, that's the reason we have a lot of options. So we deal with a lot of districts. We deal with 1,600 districts nationally. And I doubt if there's a policy manual exactly like. And we deal with all sides of districts. Everything from districts in Florida that have 350, 450,000 students to the Upper Peninsula in, in Michigan that has uh, 12 students. But I tell you that, I need to emphasize everybody has the same difficulty, and that's keeping up with their policy manual. Now, what I like about uh, what we do is these policies, templates that we're giving you have been vetted, as Dr. Gibson mentioned. They've already been vetted by an attorney. And then, of course, when your staff gets through and makes uh, the choices, then I think eventually when you get them, you should feel pretty comfortable that these policies are, are accurate and ready for you to act upon. But uh, it's uh, kind of how we, we operate, and uh, I work with each of those committees to make sure that we get that done. Now, the other thing was also mentioned is uh, we update twice a year. So you don't want to get behind. It's really easy to get behind, and it's difficult to know uh, what policies, you don't even know what a policy may be necessary, is it necessary? But we have our attorneys look at all the federal legislation. We look at all the uh, court decisions in West Virginia. We look at all the legislation and everything like that. So that's the other thing I like what we do. Uh, the other thing was mentioned too that I like what we do is we have that search engine. So now your policy manual becomes a great administrative tool. So very quickly, if a student is suspended or expelled, I can type one of those words in there, and it's going to bring up the particular policy that deals with suspension and expulsion. And then 
uh, I can follow that. Now our warranty only runs as far as uh, the implementation. We provide you the template. Now if you do something and not following our policy, then we don't warranty that obviously. But if you follow our policy and uh, it's challenged, then we support you on that and provide legal services. So I don't know whether you have any particular questions on how we operate, uh, but uh, that's kind of the way we do it in all the districts in uh, West Virginia. And it's the same process we use in all our six of our states. I have some questions. Um, you, you said you had a good meeting today. Who are you, what are you talking about? What meeting? I, I just I met with the superintendent and David Banks and Lori and uh, uh, Hans, right? Uh, we met with them and uh, just went over this uh, this process again. They had questions and we answered it. And uh, we got the committee people uh, appropriately in each of those divisions and set those timelines. And I just, uh, it, it wasn't clear. You just sure. Um, uh, you said that um, so there's a warranty until you know as long as the, the school system follows it you said you update twice a year so is the warranty only good for six months oh no no the warranty is good forever uh -huh. uh, as you know as long as you follow the policy we have so why uh, are you updating twice a year? because of uh, changing laws okay. both on federal level state level okay. uh, court cases federal legislation federal uh, regulations so what happened since last year? Because I saw some of your work, I think, from last year, this time last year. You may have. And But I haven't seen anything since. I don't recall. Maybe I'm wrong. but I'd have to look. I think we put an update out in August, and we're working on an update right now that should be released. We have a meeting next week with our attorneys that should be released again. And so that's a I'm pretty just, large update. I'm just saying, so... Will the board see twice a year the updates? Do we vote on those? Because I, I just think I yes. don't remember doing it twice. It's yeah, and you probably haven't done the updates yet because okay. you really don't necessarily start doing the updates until you get policies adopted because you don't need to necessarily update them until you get that. But uh, uh, you're going to start seeing that now since you get those sections passed. As we change those sections, then you'll provide an update. And what we provide is an overview of uh, what policies are changing, why they're changing them, and then we actually show you where they've changed. Mm -hmm. And I always recommend that superintendents provide that to the board so when we're coming in here and you're asking for policies to be changed, you can see very readily why we're changing it and how we're changing it. Uh, to keep you well versed on what's the, going on. The last, uh, the set that I saw this time last year it w was very confusing. What was your recommendation versus what's required by the state? It would be really helpful to put it in two different colors or something. I, I don't know if there is a way to make that clear because we just saw a bunch of lines and they were marked out. And that's what I remember. I could be wrong, but that's what I recall wondering, is this uh, this company's, you know, suggestion or is this a state? Well, the, uh, we could attempt to do that. The problem is the policies might have be full of uh, so much state code and there's other sections in there that are not state code. So you get uh, mixtures and things, so it's, it's kind of a difficult task to identify each one that is uh, state code. Now we list at the bottom of it, if it's based on state code, at the very bottom it's gonna be a legal reference point and say West Virginia Code 18A 5-1. So you can look at that and certainly see which what part of that is, uh, is code. But I understand what you're saying. You like to determine between yeah. what I mean, state just code. Just to be thorough, if you're gonna present something that you're not here to present it to us, and we're left with a bunch of lines and we have to decipher. Well, actually, what I, I am involved in the process. When you do an update, I meet at least two hours with your district to be there when you're updating, and then uh, we're all on board together 
So then when the superintendent presents that to you, I've already looked at your, your yeah, update. But the board doesn't know what's your advice versus what's the state. That's my point. That's, that's all. It would, for me personally, it just seems that it would be, you know, um, pretty more efficient to just make it clear what is the state policy. I know you said you put the code at the bottom. Um, so I guess we're to assume that unless we see code at the bottom, everything else is just up for grabs. Yeah, if you don't see a code at the bottom, then most likely it's not based on any particular law. Yeah, because I remember a lot of places where I didn't see a lot of state, and I saw a lot of changing from shall to, to may and shall in a lot of places where it became, you know, you're supposed to do it, well suddenly you can if you want. And that, I remember, for me, it's been a year, but I Most of the time when we have shall, shall or may, uh, that means there's a choice. Uh, and we gave you that choice. The district wants to do this or the district doesn't want to do it. So lots of times we have uh, may and shall and build in the policies. It's just other, uh, uh, a way of making sure what you want is what you get. Uh, we don't want to dictate shall to you if you don't really have to do it. <clears throat> if you want to do it, that's fine. But we need to write a policy. Well, well, why wouldn't we just take the state policy then if everything else is, you know? In well, in some cases, uh, you're going to see verbatim, uh, one of our policies is exactly like state code, exactly. particularly in personnel section. Do you, are you familiar with, do you have an attendance policy? Yeah, 5200. Have you seen what we have? Uh, which I don't think I've seen it yet, oh, okay. but. Just curious about it. The other thing is uh, mentioned today is uh, our policy for attendance is 5200. So if we have an administrative guideline that administrative guideline is going to be named 5200A. If you have another guideline you want to implement, it be B or C, so forth. And then our forms to implement attendance would be 5200F1 for form. If you have five forms, it's going to be F1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's kind of our system and how it all ties together. Dr. Gibson, I don't want anything I've missed. Did you want to clarify? Or? I, have, I have one quick question about the process. On here, there's um, timelines and dates. So for like 2000 program policies, it has a timeline of December 6th to January 24th. Does that mean that's when the committee is going to be looking at it and then they would bring it to us January 24th? That's the maximum amount of time for the committee to review that policy, look at all of the options, and then create uh, suggestions for the board and bring it to the board. Yes, ma'am. And again, those are the larger sections are like instruction. We gave more time for one of those sections. You'll note is for the board um, that you're the ones who write that section. So we'll have to pull you guys together and we'll review that and look at um, which things you have options on. Sort of like when I sat down and did that 1,000 administrative section and I put it up in slides one at a time and said. You can click may or shall. You can click the superintendent has the power to do this, the board has the power to do this, or both have the power to do that, and go through them so that they can, the committee does that work and say, here's everything we recommend and why, and then that comes to you. The goal is that um, by July 1, 2022, we have a completely online, fully automated, searchable, policy manual with linked administrative guidelines and forms, um, which is a heavy, heavy lift. So we have to do it one section at a time. And, and your staff's gonna be busy. I won't uh, try to kid you. It takes a, a while to do, but it's not an inordinate amount of work. But the important thing is the dates have been set for these committees when they need to finish the work. If anything's going to get done, you always need to say, this is when it needs to be done by, and, you, and then it, you know, it, well, the measure gets done. So it's the same way here. If uh, you say you want it done at a certain time, that generally gets done. 
you don't do that, it'll linger for years and years because everybody is busy and their plate is already full. And we understand that, but we think it's important to set the dates and, and make sure someone's driving that, to make sure that's done. Any other questions or comments? You, in your packet, you have my business card, and I gave it, gave it to you for a reason. If uh, you have any questions, give me a call, and I'd be glad to discuss it with you. And uh, oftentimes people want to know what attorneys we're using. In West Virginia, we use uh, Densmore uh, for state's material. Uh, in your pack of some place, you're going to see where you see a couple of law firms that we use out of Washington, D.C. for federal legislation. With that, I have nothing else unless you have additional questions. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and also tonight to meet with you. But don't you hesitate. Give me a call if you have a question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't worked long enough again. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Excuse me, young lady. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Are you requesting any action on that? Okay. Next up, we have a request approval for an RFP bid for the Washington High School Auxiliary Gym bond project. <laughs> did your heart just flutter? It did. I felt it. I felt it over here <laughs> this oh. evening. Good evening, and this evening I would like to ask that uh, we go out to bid for an RFP for the Washington High School Auxiliary Gym, which is a bond project. All right, is there a motion to go out with an RFP bid for the Washington High School Auxiliary Gym? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? It was, um, yes. Does that include lights out there, too? No, ma'am. <laughs> Restrooms. Okay. <laughs> just checking. <laughs> first things first, Ms. <laughs> I'll just keep bringing it up. <laughs> I he and I hear you. <laughs> Any other questions? No. No, I'm good. All right. All in favor of approving um, to go out for the RP bid for the Washington High School Auxiliary Gym, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Next, we have action to approve the change, the November 22nd meeting to November 29th due to the Thanksgiving holiday. Is there a motion to approve that? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, Mr. Cable. Any discussion or question? All in favor of moving the November 22nd meeting to November 9th, 29th, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right. Next up for superintendent's comments. Uh, yes, ma'am. I simply wanted to um, do a couple of quick thank yous. Uh, in the past two weeks, we've met with the principals group. We met with the faculty senate and for the very first time, we met with our uh, newly constituted service senate. And in each one of those, we took an agenda to them of information about what was happening uh, throughout the system and solicited feedback and discussion from them on our initiatives in recruitment and retention, feedback on our Friday half days, feedback on our virtual program, so that we were really doing a 360. And um, I have to say it has been pretty very time consuming but it's been pretty remarkable we've gotten lots of feedback for the level of consistency in terms of sharing information all of those groups have uh, one drive folders where we are dropping all of the same documents to them they are all getting the same information um, and they are all working on the committees in terms of badging and career ladders and in paperwork reduction and giving us feedback um, we're working another round in the next two weeks with uh, principals again, faculty senate and service senate um, on uh, going forward with suggestions from them about um, some focused student time 
where we're really like we only have so much time we only have so much of you we really need to spend it where it matters with kids and cut back on some of this peripheral um paperwork um for for folks to do so we've gotten some good suggestions and we're working our way through that but um really the positivity and the um the generosity and the hard work uh in all of these meetings faculty senate service senate principals they they haven't come with problems that they don't have suggested solutions to so um this is just a huge thank you um uh, and I can certainly send the board all of those names for the folks who are serving on the faculty senate and the service senate because they do this outside of their work hours on their own time to represent their peers, get them accurate information, and help their voices be heard. And uh, they really do a marvelous job. So just a thank you to them um, and a uh, finally a recognition and a thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't say as the daughter of uh, Marine Corps, uh, Vietnam veteran and as the sister of uh, National Guardsmen who's done tours of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, a huge thank you to our veterans. And I hope that uh, those of you who um, uh, go out on your Thursday Veterans Day holiday, remember the purpose of it and uh, honor veterans for the freedoms that uh, we enjoy that you're exercising right now as elected officials. So thank you. Executive session this evening? Uh, yes, ma'am. We have an executive session for legal and for land. All right. And do you anticipate any action? That's a good question. Um, perhaps. Possible. Possible action. On which yeah. one? Legal. Is there a motion to go into the executive uh, session? Congratulations to all our kids that played fall sports, but congratulations to the Washington boys soccer team yeah. for making a long run in yeah. the playoffs. Yeah. And congratulations to Jefferson's football team for making the playoffs. Games on Saturday. Games on Saturday, yes. So congratulations to, to all these kids that played fall sports. So. And winter sports started today. So. I was going to say they're probably already going. We started swim <laughs> practice last week or something. <laughs> oh, where's yeah. that natatorium? Yes. <laughs> yes. Onward to the uh, natatorium. <laughs> Joyce. Joyce, I'm counting on you. <laughs> you were living on the edge with the lights. I'm, hey. You just <laughs> jumped right in, didn't you? <laughs> you have not because you asked not. Oh, great. <laughs> Is there a motion to go into executive session for legal with possible action and land? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Ogden. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Cable. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you.